Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. I'm Ara Veloce and today we're going to be reviewing an absolutely beautiful and blast to use wheel and that is the Cube Controls CSX3. Now I have no affiliation with Cube Controls. I was actually sent this wheel from a friend and I've been absolutely loving every minute with it. With that being said, let's just dive right into the specs. The CSX3 has a 4 inch Vocore screen at 800 by 480 resolution with touchscreen support through SimHub. There are 12 RGB backlit buttons. You can get the wheel as standard with only four paddles, two shifters and two double clutch paddles, or you can do the optional six paddle setup that adds two shifters on top. There are four front facing encoders and four thumb encoders, as well as two seven way funky switches, which you can pretty much also use these as encoders as well. There are two on off toggle switches. These aren't momentary where you can go up and down. It's just either on or off. These are not RGB. They only go to green. And of course we got to have the RGB shift lights and these are in a three by 11 by three configuration. On the back of the wheel, we have a little on off switch. So if you get your wheel and you, it's not turning on, it's probably just got to press that little button in the back. This is a wired wheel and it uses a magnetic cable connection. The total weight of the wheel without quick release is 1,143 grams and the wheel is 282 millimeters wide. It is built with a strong carbon fiber front plate with an aluminum back housing and the grips are molded to the carbon fiber front plate. The price for this wheel starts off at 1,270 euros for the wheel with four paddles. If you want to upgrade to the six paddle option, the price jumps up to 1,359 euros. And if you want to change the color of the shifters and the spacer in the back from anodized black to anodized blue, that's an additional 30 euros. All right, now to the most important part of the wheel. How does it feel? Hey, that rhymed. I, I didn't plan that. Should that be a new segment catchphrase? <laughs> When I first picked up this wheel, I immediately loved how the grips felt in my hands. Um, it's definitely my favorite that I've experienced so far. It's not too thick and not too thin. That's what she said. <laughs> Michael. Michael. And it's got kind of an interesting shape to it. Uh, they're not the widest grips from the front, but from the side, they kind of have this like banana like shape. It gives a lot of space on the back where your fingers wrap around the wheel and it just feels very comfortable for me. Grips are very personal and subjective, but like I said, out of every wheel, uh, these are definitely my favorite. On the back of the grips at the top, there is a plastic insert to reduce wear in a high friction zone. Grips themselves seem to hold up very well and be extremely durable. Personally, I feel like I would never have an issue and I actually would probably prefer if it was just one completely rubber grip. I think it would feel just a little bit nicer because if you are looking for it, you can notice that. But I guess this is an issue that they're trying to address with older wheels uh, wearing. Maybe it's for people that have really Hercules type grips that they really wear through it. Some might maybe find that little bit annoying and some probably most wouldn't even notice it at all. So take that for what you will. The rubber material is pretty hard. I'm not sure what the durometer is, but it, you can get a little bit of squish out of it, but it's not going to be like a, a, a rubber squeaky toy or anything like that. Uh, they're pretty rigid overall. And like I said earlier, there's absolutely really no signs of wear. And that's with a lot of usage, a lot of endurance races and going pretty hard on the wheel. Uh, so it looks to be holding up very well. The build of the grips and the wheel itself is rock solid. There's absolutely no, no flex in this thing. I never had an issue with anything like that. This thing is really strong. The aluminum back plate is well machined. Really no complaints with the overall strength and rigidity of the wheel. This thing is rock solid. The 282 millimeter grip size is a welcome boost if you're coming from like a Fanatic formula rim that I believe is about 270 or 275, somewhere around there. It feels right for a formula rim. Uh, I, I like the size, the 282 millimeter size, and I don't even mind it when I drive other class cars that aren't formula. So if you're going for an authentic formula size rim, I think this fits pretty well. But for an all rounder wheel, I know some people would prefer maybe like a 300 millimeter. Uh, so that is something to think about. When it comes to the ergonomics of the wheel, the button placement is great. I can reach pretty much all the buttons without having to change my grip, except for just some of the bottom buttons that I don't really use that often anyways. The buttons themselves have nice responsive feedback with no squishiness when you press them. They feel really solid and really tactile. Here's a little sound test. If you're comparing something to like a Fanatic wheel, they feel much better and even a little bit snappier than the Sim Racing Bay wheel. Um, overall, probably the best button snappiness feeling that I've felt so far in a Sim wheel. 
The button guards are made out of plastic, and I know this could be a downside for a lot of people, especially at this price point, that absolutely hate plastic on their high-end wheels. For me, this doesn't really bug me that much. Uh, I think the matte finish on the plastic looks fine. It's not really a critical piece. Yes, aluminum would be nicer, um, but also that might drive the price point up higher. So pick your poison, I guess. Part of the plastic that I think makes it look cheap on a wheel of this level is the plastic that surrounds the screen. On the front, it has the matte finish, which I think looks much better, but on the corners of it, it has a gloss finish, and that just looks kind of cheap. So I kind of wish they just did matte all around. I think that would have kept an overall much higher quality look, even though that it's still gonna be plastic. So for the labels on the buttons, this wheel uses stickers versus having something like UV printing. UV printing is typically looks nicer, but you don't have the customizable flexibility that you do with stickers. So either way, you're gonna have trade-offs. So I don't really mind having stickers. The only complaint I have is I just wish they were a little bit higher quality. It might be difficult to show this on camera, but the black stickers that have uh, shine through lettering, the black part of the sticker, you can kind of see like little black dots, like it's not like a solid black. Which, while you're racing, let's be honest, it's not really a big deal. But when you're looking up close at such a high-end quality wheel, it does look a little bit off place for a product like this. And then the issue with the clear stickers with the black lettering is that the way the buttons are lit with the RGB comes off a little bit harsh. So instead of having multiple RGB lights around the button and basically diffusing the light, the RGB is directly in the center of the button and you can actually see the individual red, blue, green LEDs and it can come off a little bit harsh if it's not being uh, fully blocked by whatever letter or sticker you decide to use. Once again, not really a big deal while you're racing. I mean, you're not gonna be staring at the buttons or the stickers when you're going 150 miles an hour on the back straight. But with a high-end wheel like this, when you're really examining the details, I would just like to see those things be just a little bit better. Another thing with the stickers is I think they just need to have way more options for what icons and, and items to put on the, uh, on the wheel. It was a little difficult for me to find the right sticker for each button that I wanted, and I ended up having to compromise on quite a few of them. Another thing you might notice is that after you put the stickers on, they might look a little crooked. And I was thinking, wow, am I extremely bad at putting these stickers on? But there is a little bit of wiggle room on the buttons where they can kind of turn just slightly left to right, and that might make them the stickers look a little bit off place. That's another minor OCD complaint, but I know there's a lot of you guys out there, so I'm looking out for you. A little pro tip if you're setting the RGB button colors for your wheel and you want to set it to white, the buttons for some reason appear pinkish when you set them to white. I'm not quite sure why this is because the lights for the LED encoders, uh, these all look fine when you set them to white. But if you want the buttons to look white, just set them to a like very light baby blue and this will get them much closer to white instead of that weird pink shade color. I'm not sure if this is a software bug that needs to be fixed or if it's a differences in the LEDs that they use uh, having different like white balance or something but yeah uh, kind of weird hopefully that gets fixed in a, a future update or something the on off switches at the top of the wheel light up green in the on position and the light is off in the off position there's no RGB control so it's always going to be green and nothing you can do about that so sorry if it clashes with your uh, color uh, setup I don't really like using these for car control functions because since it's only an on and off switch and it doesn't know the difference between on and off, they can get out of sync. So for example, if you use it to turn on the ignition of the car and then you go back to pits without turning it off first, the on position would now be the off position, if that makes sense. And at first I wish they had a momentary toggle switch like the Fnatic Formula wheel, for example, where it goes up and down. So you have two functions there. But once I found the right use case, I no longer wish for that functionality and I was extremely happy with using them how I wanted to. And the way I like to use them is actually for my Discord voice chat. It's super useful for when somebody walks in the room trying to talk to you and you wanna quick mute yourself. Or if you're on live stream and you have a bunch of friends on Discord and they're all chatting it up, but you're trying to talk to chat in the live stream, boom, flip the deafening switch, flip on the other side for the mute switch. So love that feature now and really happy with it. Kind of want it on all my wheels, surprisingly. Now onto the front encoders. These things feel fantastic. Got a nice ooh, tactile response to them. Very easy to, uh, you know, 
select as much as you want and you got four on the front they do not uh you can't use them as a click button i guess one less functionality there uh, there's so much functionality on the wheel i don't think you'd ever be sure of but you know maybe somebody wants that feature uh, so they're just left and right only and there's also no multi-position function where a specific location uh, correlates to a specific number so for example like this fanatic wheel all these encoders are specifically have a number and if you set it up to the multi-position function, you can select four and traction control in the in-game car will always be at four. It sounds nice to have. And for some people, I'm sure they love that functionality. I found it could be a little bit annoying sometimes when you're switching between a lot of different cars and, and even a lot of different setups where one setup might be set to traction control two and ABS five and another setup might be traction control four and ABS three. If you don't adjust your uh, multi-position switch um, positions, they will change the uh, traction control ABS to whatever they're set to. So you have to constantly kind of be always thinking about it where if you're just using an encoder like a left and right or up and down, then you don't have to worry about what the setup is uh, or what the car is. You can just start off on the default setting that it is and then you could just adjust it from there to whatever your preference is so if you really like that feature on the fanatic wheels this might be a letdown to you i see this as totally fine and actually prefer it this way um, but that's just my personal opinion uh, you know what you like now onto the thumb encoders an issue i had with the fanatic one is they are way too easy to spin and you can often miss spin them and change settings when you don't mean to especially when you're trying to save the car from a, a oversteer or something like that. But I think this wheel went too far in the opposite direction. I like the stiffness of the detents, but I think they're a little bit hard to access. These ones right here are really, really small and they're, they don't stick out very much. So it can be very difficult to only do like small movements. Like if I only want to, you know, change one traction uh, control setting it's a lot easier to just flick them but an issue with encoders and sim racing that hasn't been fixed by a lot of manufacturers with the uh, firmware is that if you spin them too fast they actually don't read properly so if i just flick them which is the easiest and best way to use it uh my traction control will just like jump or not even move at all um instead of just going like one degree uh, so i wish they're a little bit easier to just kind of single click and move with your thumb slowly. And with gloves, that gets even worse. So this has kind of been one of my biggest frustrations with the wheel, with the, uh, the thumb encoders. The inner thumb encoders on the inside are a little bit better. Once again, they're kind of recessed and they have these like plastic uh, guards that don't let you uh, spin it too much. But you can at least more easily just do one click on the inside thumb encoders. So those work pretty well. Uh, I kind of wish all of them were just a little bit easier to reach with your thumb in terms of actually moving it it feels like you kind of have to try a little bit too hard but your mileage may vary you can change the pulse width in the cube control software but i've yet to find a setting that really improved the situation perhaps there's a sweet spot but i haven't found it quite yet and of course we have to have the funky switches and we've got double baby oh Oh yeah. <laughs> so these are seven ways. So we have up, down, left, right, and you can click it for a button press and then you can turn it left and right like an encoder as well. These are just so useful. They have so much functionality. I like using the right one for my black box. I'll spin it to switch between different black boxes in iRacing. And then I would navigate and select uh, with the um, left and right, up, down, and then click. For the left one, I use it to change my dashes on the screen in SimHub. So I just map it in SimHub to go up, down and it changes which dash I'm using. So that versatility is great. You can never have too many funky switches. In fact, maybe they need to make a wheel with just everything as a funky switch. Can you imagine? <laughs> oh yeah, and the aluminum caps on the funky switches and, and the encoders all look very nice. Very high quality CNC and anodized. Uh, no complaints, chef's kiss. Now the shifters, oh, the shifters. My favorite part about this wheel. Coming from Fnatic, I didn't think I would like loud undampened shifters but i have been fully converted this is the way and if anybody in your house complains about them that's their problem these things are loud have a short throw 
and they're extremely snappy, just like they should be. They just have this super satisfying feedback. When you're downshifting in a corner, you just, you have so much confidence. It feels great, absolutely love it. And oftentimes when I'm not driving, I'm just sitting in my rig clicking away. They're also rock solid with wiggle or play. These things have really tight tolerances and just overall great build quality in this regard. You also have two separate adjustments to get them placed exactly where you want them to be. You can bring them closer or farther away, and then you can slide them farther in or farther out as well. The switches do use Hall Effect sensors, so they are contactless. There's no physical switches that they're clicking to actuate the shifters. So while switches are typically rated for millions and millions of clicks, with Hall Effect sensors, theoretically, you have no wear point there. Now, I just learned recently that they have addressed the only problem I've had with the shifters, and I haven't even had it personally. It was when a friend tried my rig, and that's when you pull too hard on the shifter, you can actually pull it out of place and have to uh, push it back. I believe now if you order one, they have a new shifter design that has multiple lock-in points where this won't happen anymore, so it's good to see that. I am kind of surprised that that was even an issue in the first place. I think they should have caught that when they were designing it, but at least they, they fixed it now. Now onto the double clutches. I always kind of found these kind of awkward to reach even after trying to make some adjustments, but you're only really using them on race starts or coming out of the pits, so it's not like the biggest deal in the world. I'll just reposition my hand a little lower and grab it versus when my hand's up here, I kind of have to like use my pinky or this finger. So I just lower my grip, do the race launch, and then get go racing. And once again, build quality on these is very nice. There's no wiggle or play. Uh, they're solid, got a good amount of travel. They do have adjustable travel, and you can also adjust how far in the paddle is. And they have a good amount of tension, a nice smooth pull. But yeah, they're just clutch paddles, uh, you know, nice build quality. I just wish they were maybe a little bit more accessible, but other than that, yeah, pretty decent. All right, so I wanted to go over through the calibration process because this has been quite of a frustrating experience and I still haven't quite gotten them to work like they should. I have the Cube Control software open for the CSX3. I'm gonna go to the paddle section, enable the clutches, and before we worry about the bite point, uh, we're gonna wanna keep this on disabled, save the settings. So we're gonna go back to the inputs tab and we're gonna calibrate the clutch paddles. I'm gonna hit calibrate for the left one here. I'm gonna pull lightly so I don't have any issues with reaching the maximum value. And it looks to be okay there. And now I'm gonna calibrate the right one. Once again, not pulling too hard and hit save. Now one issue I had was a lack of reliability with the calibration of the clutch paddles every now and then, and looks to be happening now when I just released the left clutch paddle, is there is like 1% of clutch still activated on the clutch paddle. And I've had times where I calibrated the paddles and it wouldn't even reach the maximum value. And there's no dead zone you can set. So the lack of a dead zone functionality is really disappointing. And just a lack of reliability with the paddles actually reaching the values, the minimum maximum values that they're supposed to has really been lacking as well and frustrating. I'm gonna go ahead and save the settings and go back to the paddles tab. And now we're gonna activate the left clutch paddle. And I'm not gonna to touch the bite point just yet, but I'm gonna save the settings and verify that they're working properly. So now we go to the inputs. And so if I pull the left paddle, it goes to 35%. If I pull the right paddle, it goes to 100%. And you look, it did just kind of stutter getting to that 100 there, but it looks to be reaching the 100. So now when we use it, we pull both paddles we release the right one and the left one's still holding at the bite point. And then we release the left one to fully release the clutch. So everything seems to be good there. Now they added a feature where you can adjust the bite point on the fly using one of the rotary encoders. So I'm gonna assign a rotary encoder here. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that setting. And let's go back to the software, make sure everything works. And all of a sudden now my right paddle's not working anymore. I do my left one, it goes to the bite point, right one, nothing so what if i change the bite point manually let's save that setting now it works again so now we're getting the right paddle to work again i'm going to adjust my bite point by a few levels here all right now you can see it's almost like 60 70 percent but my right paddle doesn't work again. 
Nothing from my right paddle. What if I just try saving the setting? I didn't touch the bite point manually. I'm just gonna go ahead and hit save the setting. Now it works again. So really there's no changing the clutch bite point on the fly because you're always gonna have to open the software to save the setting regardless. And just a little while ago while I was testing this, even then I still had buggy issues where I would save the setting and the right clutch paddle wasn't working. So I had to go back, deactivate the bite point, recalibrate the clutches and start all over again. It's been really frustrating. Um, and it's been since October that they had their last update. But to me, it seems like this is a software or firmware related issue that still hasn't been addressed. So really disappointing to see that. And I really hope that gets addressed soon because that is a bad stain on a relatively otherwise really good solid wheel. Now, if they were to fix all the issues with the clutch paddles calibrating and being able to adjust the bite point on the fly. One thing I would like to see is a plugin for SimHub. I'm using right now the actual Cube Controls CSX3 uh, SimHub dash. If I'm changing my clutch bite point, I would like to see this on my SimHub dash to see where my bite point is. Cause otherwise I'm basically spinning this with no idea where my clutch uh, is gonna be sitting at. So it'd be nice to be able to see what I'm doing with my clutch bite point on the dash itself. Now onto the top paddles. This is where these feel kind of out of place. And I think that's because they're contrasting to the fantastic quality of the shifters and the clutch, but specifically the shifter with how snappy it is. Uh, I mean, and just how solid uh, and rigid they are. These ones are made out of, of polymer, uh, like plastic. They do the job and in a vacuum, they probably feel decent but when they're sitting so close to such a good shifter the contrast is is so stark and my biggest complaint comes from when you pull them they have a little bit of play at their max throw that doesn't feel nearly as solid or rigid i would say this is the one item that doesn't really live up to the rest of the wheel especially being a additional cost add-on if you're gonna pay an additional add-on i feel like i'd rather just pay a little bit more for a higher quality part but i mean once again is it Maybe it's not that big of a deal, I don't know. And these pedals only have a single adjustment and that's just the length of the paddle. The last little weird thing with the shifters is these giant holes in the paddles themselves. I mean, I don't understand why they needed to be so big. I can stick my finger completely through them. And if you drive with the wheel long enough, you just might give it a happy ending. <laughs> is it bad that my favorite thing about this wheel is the magnetic connector? Like seriously, can Cube Controls license this out to other manufacturers because this thing is awesome. It's super strong. I've never had an issue with it disconnecting on me and it makes taking off the wheel, even being a wired wheel, super easy just to pop off the cable instead of having to unscrew it by hand and fiddle with your fingers there. Come on, we don't wanna give the wheel two happy endings. <laughs> but seriously, I really love it and I wish it was a universal standard. And one of the benefits of it being magnetic is if your wheelbase freaks out and over rotates, the magnetic connection would release instead of snapping or breaking the cable. In my own personal situation, I did have the wheelbase over rotate and it actually didn't disconnect the magnetic part. It was, I mean, the magnets are super strong and actually the part at risk was the opposite USB side for whatever reason of how it got tangled. So it might not be perfect at protecting every situation, but I definitely think it's better than a screw on connector. Regardless of the safety feature, I just love it for the ease of use. It makes taking the wheel on and off just super easy and I absolutely love it. Now the best part of the wheel the screen everybody wants a screen on their wheel it's the pinnacle of sim racing when you get a wheel with a screen on it you walk different you talk different and when explosions go off behind you you never look back now the unfortunate reality is that most people just sit in a gt position and you'd be much better off with the ddu instead as it would be much better for actually seeing your dash instead of looking farther down to see the screen on the wheel itself but we don't want to live in reality. We want to be cool. And goddamn, is it cool. <laughs> the screen is a four inch Vocor screen. And my friend that sent me the wheel found it to be a little bit too small. But personally, I've never had any complaints with the size. At four inches with an 800 by 480 resolution, the screen is really crisp and the colors are vivid too. It's also touchscreen, which is nice for flipping in between the different dash pages. I did find one quality issue that at this price point did seem a little weird to have this design decision, but that's that you can actually kind of move the screen just a little bit within the housing. This hasn't been an issue while driving with the wheel, but just another thing that doesn't really feel right for a wheel at this price point. 
The wheel is SimHub compatible, so you could use any dash you want on SimHub, which I absolutely love. I don't think any wheel in 2023 should not have SimHub support, at least with a screen that is. SimHub is just a fantastic software and really levels up the possibilities with a wheel like this. The screen is a bit recessed, so depending on what angle the steering wheel is, the top of the bezel can cut off part of the screen. I found using the wheel at the steering angle that I use it at, this hasn't been an issue for me, but another thing that could be improved upon. The RGB shift lights come in a 3.11.3 format. Nobody seems to agree what the proper amount of shift lights is for a car, so sometimes you'll find the amount doesn't match. The good news is there is profiles made by Yoop that fit this uh, 3.11.3 format, so you can get matching or slightly adjusted LED shift lights for every car in iRacing, for example. I do wish Cube Control supplied LED profiles themselves, because the one that is included in SimHub is just a generic RPM percentage-based shift light that is just generic for all cars and sometimes doesn't get you the right shifting moments for some specific cars. But since it's SimHub compatible, you can always just make your own custom LED profiles if you want to. So that's, like I said, a fantastic feature to have and every wheel should be supported by SimHub. The last thing I wanna mention is the built-in spacer on the back of the wheel. I understand why these exist due to the sizing and form factor constraints of the wheel, but I just kinda of wish they figured out a way to not have these because it can make it more difficult for you to get the right steering wheel position when you have a lot of different wheels and your other wheels don't use spacers, so this one will end up being a little bit closer to you, unless you actually adjust the distance of your wheelbase, which for most of us is not an easy adjustment to make. Now, thankfully, the spacer on the cube controls wheel isn't a huge one, but that is something to take in consideration for your own setup. I know I've been super nitpicky with this wheel, but I honestly absolutely love it. This thing, like I said, it's been a real blast to use, and it does feel really, really good. Sure, it's got its ups and downs, but there's no such thing as a perfect product. There's only what's best for you. And I just like to go through every little detail so you can figure that out for yourself. There's nothing I hate more than seeing a bunch of raving reviews on a product. And then when I finally get it in my hands, there's some blatant feature or thing about it that nobody seemed to mention that could be a potential deal breaker for some people. And with some critical feedback that just allows the manufacturers to upgrade and improve their products to have better versions for us in the future. Despite all that, this is one of my favorite formula wheels on the market. Just, I mean, aesthetically, I think it's one of the coolest looking formula wheels. And I would be happy using this thing for a very, very long time. I mean, like I said, I love it. I did get peer pressured by my friend that sent me this wheel to order the GSI Hyper P1. So if you're not subscribed already, get subscribed to see if that wheel ends up being my ultimate end game wheel. In a couple weeks, it might be goodbye, little buddy. I hope you enjoyed this review. Leave a like down below if you did. And if you have any questions, go ahead and feel free to leave them in the comments down below. And while you're down there, you can check my social media links in the description. You can follow my Instagram if you want to see some behind the scenes content or some other cool short form content. Or you can join my Discord if you need help with your rig or you want to talk into more detail about something sim racing related. And lastly, if you want to see the pinnacle of racing, you can see me live on Twitch sometimes. But that's it for me for today. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.